reading today comes from Paul's letter to Titus in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authority, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak Ill, ill or evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Shandon. I love when Shannon reads scripture. Uh, there's just a sense of hope and energy to to the reading of the word, you can breathe a sigh of relief now. Um, this book has the power to change your life. And when she reads it, I believe that. I'm like, oh, man, yes, that's how scripture should be read. Uh, before I dive into the sermon, I just want to say a couple words about uh, some, potentially some news that you heard about the United Methodist Church this past week. If you've read uh, headlines or seen things uh, on the Internet, I, I want to say a couple things. Just um, one thing I want to say is that news outlets have a way of sensationalizing, sensationalizing everything. Uh, and, and news outlets aren't always aware of the actual nuances of the polity of our denomination. Um, and so you might have seen uh, headlines about a proposal that's been put forward, uh, and, and that has been put forward, but nothing has happened yet, and nothing will potentially even happen until what we call our general conference, which happens every four years. Our general conference this year happens to occur in May. Um, this proposal was set forth by 16 people. Um, now, a, 16 people with a much wider network of people who have been praying and working together. But these 16 people uh, are representative of the vast array of voices in the United Methodist Church globally. And so there were representatives from all over the world and representatives from all over the theological spectrum. And, and what's maybe different about this proposal as opposed to other ones that have been put forth previously is that there was at least unanimous agreement uh, to move forward with this proposal with those 16 different voices represented. Um, and so one thing that we've done here at First Methodist Richardson is as we've looked at the discussions that are occurring around the United Methodist Church and our denomination, we have not shied away from keeping our... Um, congregation informed, and so legislation hasn't even been written for this proposal yet. Um, let me step back and say the proposal creates um, pathways for amicable separation for certain bodies within the United Methodist Church, and so to say that you, you read the headlines and say, well, this United Methodist Church is going to split. Well, that's a little extreme. Um, the, the pathway of the proposal has been set forth for, I like that term, amicable separation, even though uh, it, it's heartbreaking that there are groups that would separate from the United Methodist Church. Um, it's not as sensationalized as the headlines like to make it. Can I say that? Um, let me also say that even people who would separate from our denomination, for better or worse, are people. And everybody in this conversation is just doing our best to try to figure out how to love Jesus and how to do it best in our context. And so let me break it down to the local church. Like I was going to say, one of the things that we haven't shied away from is keeping our congregation informed. And so we want to point you to our website. We're going to continually update our website. 
with the latest information as these proposals continue to take shape toward General Conference in May. Um, we have a great delegate, uh, set of uh, elected delegates from the North Texas Conference. We've got 10 delegates. It just so happens that two of them are from our church. The head of our delegation happens to be our senior pastor, Clayton Oliphant, and one of our lay delegates is Shannon Klein, who just read scripture here. Um, and so we are blessed to be well represented from First Methodist Richardson to the General Conference in May. But again, breaking it down to, well, then what does that mean for our church here? Um, what it means is that we're going to continue to serve Christ. We're going to continue to pursue our mission to welcome all people for Christ, to grow people in Christ, and to serve people with Christ. That's what we do here. Uh, we are uh, hopeful to remain a part of the United Methodist denomination. Clayton has been a part of these conversations as they've taken place. He told me last night on the phone, he said, Josh, I'm actually more hopeful about the future of our denomination than I've been for a few years. And so as this all kind of sorts itself out, we are going to continue to be what God has called us to be at First Methodist Richardson. We're going to continue to serve the schools around us. We're going to continue to gather on a weekly basis. We're going to continue to welcome all people. We're going to continue to be a church that takes missions seriously and that says, okay, God, who are you shaping us to be? And tomorrow morning when we wake up, we're going to serve Christ in our schools and in our workplaces and in every area of influence that we have. So I, too... I'm hopeful. The bottom line is this. God still sits on the throne. Through all of our human conversations, God still sits on the throne. And I can put my trust and confidence in that truth. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, speaking of which, uh, let me also say this, because this is going to lead right into my sermon. At First Methodist Richardson, we say that we're a big tent church. As a big tent church, that means that we, as a part of our DNA, have come to terms with the fact that we aren't going to agree on everything about life. And some people would say, well, well, there's certain things that you need to agree on. And yeah, we do. We say we agree on the essentials. Um, and not only do we think that it's a good thing that we are okay agreeing to disagree, we actually think it's healthy. We think that it's a healthy practice of being Christians, uh, recognizing that we can worship Christ together and agree to disagree. This is what it means to be a big tent congregation. As we dive into the scripture in Titus, you'll see the connections to what Paul was writing to Titus as he was setting up this early church. I remember when I was in seminary, so it's been 11 years since I finished my Master of Divinity at Fuller Seminary, Pasadena, California. When you sign up for seminary, the first three semesters that I was in seminary, they made you be a part of a small group. And my small group was made up of nine different people. We were from nine different Christian traditions. I, I was culture shocked getting into it, but it was one of the most rich experiences I've ever had, having conversations on a weekly basis about why we don't see eye to eye on different theological tenets. It was so rich to sit around and say, oh, that's why you believe it that way. Oh, that's why you emphasize and have communion every week. Oh, that's why you worship on Saturdays and not Sundays. All of these different things that we didn't necessarily agree on, but yet as we sat together in that small group, we recognized each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and yet we worship differently because of our different contexts and different ways that, that we had been shaped and here at First Methodist Richardson, that's something that we value because we see, we see the health that exists when we can set our focus on Christ and actually sit down to listen to one another's perspective. When you're in seminary, there's four different types of theology that you study. One is historical theology. So you're talking about the history of the church and how the, the family tree, if you will, went from Jesus to one split here and another split here and another split. And all of these branches of the church still make up the church. We are all still a part of the family of God. Then we talk about biblical theology. In biblical theology, you're studying the word. You're studying maybe biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek. And you're, you're diving into scripture and what it means then, what it means now, and, and how it came to be. That's biblical theology. Then you have systematic theology. Systematic theology is where you think more philosophically about things. Okay, so how can God create a rock that he can't move? Or maybe he can, or can he? And, or is God he? Or what language are we using? And, and, and what, what system of theology does our denomination fit? And this is systematic theology. It's these, these conversations that kind of hurt your brain. So historical, biblical, systematic theology. And then we have what's called practical theology. 
And for all intents and purposes, practical theology is just that. It's, it's practical. It's where you ask, okay, how does the church react to these different theological tenets? How does this shape what we do here? And so I remember in my time at Fuller, as we were talking about practical theology, we talked about the changing nature of the church over generations. Think about how different the church is today in its prominence in American culture than it was, say, 50 years ago, even like 10 years ago, but especially 50 years ago. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you could pretty much assume that your neighbors had some sort of at least nominal knowledge of who Jesus was, of this thing called the Bible, of this, this movement, this religion, this group of people that we call Christians. It was a pretty prominent part of American culture. And yet today, in the year 2020, I almost said 2019, in 2020, that can no longer be assumed. We live in a very different culture in the United States, and the church holds a very different place within culture. So part of practical theology is asking, okay, well then, how do we be the church faithfully? How can we be the the church faithfully in the year 2020 when it's a lot harder to get people to just show up here on Sunday mornings in the first place? If we were to follow historical theology from the day that Jesus began this movement of the church and follow it forward, we would see that in the early days of the church, the church had to, had to hide. The church was persecuted, the early church. So when we read Titus and Paul's writing to, to Titus as he's starting this church on the island of Crete, we see that the church had tough questions because the church was a minority. These people that were followers of the way, followers of Christ, weren't always allowed to worship in the open. And we follow church history forward until the year 313 A.D. 313 was a significant year for the Christian church because in 313, Emperor Constantine decriminalized Christianity. Christianity quickly made its way to prominence within the Roman Empire at that year, 313. It began this era that we call Christendom where the assumption of what religion you were was set. If you were a part of the Roman Empire, this was the now official religion of the Roman Empire, you were probably a Christian. Christendom reigned for generations, particularly even into the early history of the United States. Into the 1950s, we said we were kind of still in this era of Christendom, where Christianity is the prominent religion, and you could assume that most people around you were Christians. Within the realm of practical theology, we now talk about the fact that we are in a post-Christendom culture. That we are now beyond this period where Christianity is the prominent religion. And ironically, in the year 2020, we've come full circle. Where we need to now ask the same questions that the earliest Christians were asking. So then if Christianity isn't the assumed religion of everybody... And how can I be a faithful witness to the love of Jesus Christ in a world that maybe not only doesn't assume Christianity, but might be antagonistic toward the way of Christ? And so we get our cues here from the earliest churches. We see here that Paul's letter to, the, to Titus says he's encouraging Titus in his leadership. He's pointing out several things that the church needs to do to, to embody the love of Christ. Just like in the first century, we too can no longer just tell people about Christ and expect them to believe it. We need to embody the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. No longer do we have the freedom to just hand somebody a piece of paper, a tract maybe that explains the the tenets of belief. No longer can we just tell people about Jesus. Today in 2020, in Richardson, Texas, In this post-Christendom culture, more than ever, we need to embody the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to live out the love of Christ to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our family members, and to our enemies. Perhaps your enemies are mixed into those three realms that I said before. More than ever, we need to embody the love of Christ. He gives all of these directions to Titus and says, remind them to obey all these rules. Remind them to be set apart. Remind them to do all these things because they've been saved. 
so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He's talking about this idea of salvation. We visited it last week when we talked about John the Baptist and the idea of repentance being a, a holistic reorientation of your life, not just believing a certain set of things, but believing them in such a way that it changes what you do. We believe that salvation, this process of being saved, is so much more than just getting this, this get-out-of-jail-free card. That this process of salvation, of being saved by Jesus' grace, by the grace of Jesus Christ, we are offered new life, eternal life, not just in heaven, but here and now. Our sins have been forgiven This grace that we've been offered, if we accept that invitation, if we give our lives to Christ, if we say, okay, God, my life is yours, it's not about me, this grace has the potential to change everything we do. Let me me set an example that might help paint this picture. When I was a kid, I lived in a great neighborhood. Uh, Just tons of kids in our neighborhood. We lived kind of out in the country, and we always gather after school, ride our bikes and meet at somebody's house and just play these epic games where the whole neighborhood was basically the boundaries. And this was like everybody had a couple acres, and so it was, it was a giant game of say, hide and go seek. We play hide and go seek. And if you played hide and go seek, you know that the first goal is to hide, right? Hide and go seek. Somebody is it, and they are looking for you. And so your first goal is to just simply hide and not be found by the person who is it. Now, the way we played the game, when you were found, you would then get out of your hiding spot and run to get to the safe place. Anybody else play like that? You don't just get hidden and then found. Once you were found, you had to outrun the person who was it. And if you made it to the tree, usually it was a tree, and you touch the tree, then you're safe. And that person who's it can't get you. So not only do they have to find you, they have to catch you. And I remember just that anxiety of, of hiding, right? And then they finally find you, and you got to jump up and just dart toward that tree. And I'm sure we had several collisions as we're running full speed toward the tree. And you, you get to that tree, you say, safe, safe. Keep that picture in mind. The other game we'd play a lot was just pickup games of, of football. And when we play f- pickup games of football, I mean, we had a variety of ages. I remember we'd all line up. You pick two captains, and we're all kind of sitting. I was usually one of the smallest kind of waiting to get picked and waiting to get picked, and everyone's just lined up, and the captains would go one at a time picking people. And then your name was finally called, and you, oh, yes, yeah, I got picked. You have this sense of pride. Everybody always got picked. You didn't leave people out, but, you know, sometimes you got picked at the beginning of the list, and sometimes you got picked at the end. It didn't matter. Once you got picked, you were on the team, and you had a role to play on that team. And the way we played, it was very disorganized. There was usually an all-time quarterback, whoever the, the alpha kid was, was the all-time quarterback, and they'd say, okay, I'm the all-time quarterback, okay, and sometimes there'd be somebody who would, like, call plays and say, you go that way, you go, most of the time, I was like, okay, you all just run, I'll throw the ball to somebody. Either way, it didn't matter to me, when I was picked for the team, I knew I was on the team, and I knew I had a role to play, even if it was just run straight, I was either distracting them from the real play, or I was actually going to go out there and try to catch the ball, I had a role to play. Now, compare and contrast these two models of games. Hide and seek, my goal was to hide and run to the tree to be safe from something that was constantly chasing me. Some people talk about salvation as this process of running and hiding so we can get to the tree and be safe. And so we say, well, we're saved from whatever we're saved from. Just get to the tree. Tell as many people as you can about the tree so they can run to the tree. And you're running in constant fear. And the way you convince people to get to the tree is you tell them about how scary the thing is that's chasing them. Get to the tree so you can be safe. I think salvation is more like a game of pickup football. Where we're all lined up and God picks us to be on the team. We respond to the invitation with pride and we say, we're in. And God says, here's your role. Welcome to the team. You get to play a part. This is the difference between being saved from and being saved for. Salvation is not just about getting to the tree so we can be safe. It's about being invited into the family. It's about being invited onto the team so that you can play a contributing role into what the team is doing together. When we change the language and we think about salvation being saved for instead of saved from, it, it changes the way that we act. For one thing, it reminds us of the communal nature of the church. 
Meaning, when we say it's not about me, it's, it's really, it's not about me. It's about us. When God invites us onto the team, God doesn't say, you're all-time quarterback. God's the all-time quarterback, come on. But we're invited to play a contributing role to what God is doing in the world, not by ourselves, but in the context of a community of people. We can't save the world. Only God can do that. But God uses us. Second thing it does is it reminds us that salvation is more holistic, meaning when we are saved, and we are not saved just saved from, but, but saved for, we are invited to be a part of this team to contribute to the redemption of all creation. That this idea of God redeeming the entire cosmos includes our role. And so it, it changes the way we think about what we do in this world, because we say, oh, I actually have a role to play in, I love what Shannon said, in God's dream for the world. How can I begin to be used by God to bring heaven to earth here and now? And the last thing it does, and I think probably the most important thing when we talk about being saved for as opposed to just being saved from, is it does remind us that it's not about me. If I'm saved from something, then it's all about me being safe. If I'm saved for something, I'm instantly thinking about others around me. How will God use me to reach the community to which I've been called. Now, as we enter this year 2020, as a church, as First Methodist Richardson, we want to take this seriously. We're kicking off this year of service. There's two things we're going to do this morning. Well, the first thing is we're kicking off the year of service. The second thing, we're going to have an opportunity to remember our baptisms this morning. And so as we always do when we uh, take communion on the first Sunday of every month, this month, this Sunday, today, we're going to add this extra element of remembering our baptism. And so as we take communion, you'll, you'll take the bread and you'll dip it in the cup and then you'll go to the bowl of water and I would invite you to feel the water and to put some, you can either do a sign of the cross on your forehead or you can just touch it and you don't have to put it anywhere if you want. And as you do so, I would encourage you to remember what it was like to be welcomed into the family of God. We believe that a significant part of what baptism is is it's our initiation into the family. And so maybe that happened for you as an infant and you don't remember it. That's why we do this, so that you have an opportunity to feel that water and to remember that you are called to be a part of this community. Or perhaps you haven't been baptized yet. I would still encourage you to come forward and, and touch the water and consider what it would mean for you to take that step, to become a part of this movement, to become a part of what it means to embody the love of God just like this earliest church, so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works as we embody the gospel of Christ in this post-Christendom culture. We're reminded as we remember our baptism that we're all in this together. I hate now that every time I say that I think of High School Musical. Anybody else? <laughs> we're all in this together. Okay. Okay. That just took me way out of a serious moment. Here's the bottom line. As we start this year 2020 together, we want to be reminded that it really isn't about me. That we are in this together. That you've been invited to be a part of the team. And if you respond in faith, you accept this grace and this forgiveness that God has given to you. You're not just saved from, but you are saved for. You're here on purpose, and God has a purpose for your life. And together, we want to ask, what does that look like? What does that look like for my church? What does that look like for me? How can I be, be used by God for God's purposes as I embody the gospel? Amen? Amen. God, we thank you so much for this promise. We thank you so much for the challenge to be used by you for your purposes. We thank you most of all for the invitation to be on the team. May we take seriously this, this invitation of grace that you've given us. May we accept this forgiveness, God. May we know that you created us and you love us and you call us to greater things and may we in full trust give our lives to you as we are reminded that life is not about us. But we want to follow in your ways, in your path. 
as you direct our steps. In your name we pray. Amen.